Welcome to Delta Computer Systems webinar series. Today's topic is controlling underdamped systems. A housekeeping item, this webinar is being recorded and will be available at the conclusion of the webinar for viewing later. There is a lot of information to cover today, so we'll be moving pretty quickly. Today's topic, as I mentioned, is underdamped systems, and Jacob will be going into details on how the RMC and RMC tools has algorithms for controlling these systems. Today's presenter is Jacob Passo, who is the Motion Product Development Manager here at Delta and is also one of our support uh, applications engineers. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Jacob. Thank you, AJ. Thank you everyone for attending. I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about underdamped systems today. I wanna to mention that if you have any questions during the webinar, you can feel free and enter those into the chat window in your GoToWebinar control panel, and I will try to answer those as we go. So today we are going to cover what underdamped means. We're gonna talk about natural frequency and frequency of acceleration cover PID and feed forward theory, including some advanced double differential gain jerk feed forward. And then we'll look at tuning with the PID and tuning with the advanced, what we call PID2. And we'll be doing it on a live hydraulic system. We will be going quickly through the information. So if you feel you need more info, you can go to our website on the education page. We have some videos. We also have some webinars there. The previous webinars are all listed there and days for coming webinars. This webinar should be posted up there within a few hours so you can share it with anyone else soon if you like. First of all, what does underdamped mean? Underdamped simply means a system that tends to oscillate. And we can test this by sending just a control signal step jump to our system, something like this. So on a hydraulic system with a valve, we would send a voltage that steps from something to something else. And then we can see what the controlled value does. If it looks like this, where it just kind of slowly ramps up and settles out, we do not call this underdamped. It's probably called critically damped or uh, overdamped or something like that. Underdamped is when it tends to oscillate. So nothing more complicated than that. System that tends to oscillate and the control signal will generally tell us if it does that or not. Now, when we talk about underdamped systems, we may run into the term second order system. If we look at a hydraulic cylinder, cylinder looks something like this and we have the oil inside on both sides of the piston. Well, that oil is actually like a spring because it does compress a little bit. And that is similar to a mass on a spring. And if we look at the mathematical model for that, that is something that tends to oscillate. And if the damping is high enough, the system may not actually oscillate, um, but it is called a second order system. So all cylinders are actually second order systems. They will have a tendency to oscillate if we hit them hard enough. And of course, how much depends on the damping. So we are going to be looking at a live system here. We have a cylinder that's 16 inch stroke. The diameter is only one inch, so not very wide at all. We have a fairly large mass, 400 pounds on this system, a decent valve, 40 liters per minute and one micrometer resolution on our position feedback. When we run this, we will see that it's going to oscillate at some frequency when we put in a step jump signal. And we call that frequency a natural frequency. That's a frequency that a system tends to oscillate at. So let's go look at this on our live system. We have here a hydraulic system. We're looking from the top here. So you see we have the cylinder in black there. It's connected to this mass that's on some linear guides, so very low friction here. You see a mess on top of the cylinder. This here is the valve. And we actually have some manual valves where we can connect this valve via hard pipe to the cylinder directly, or we can connect it to the cylinder via the hose. Good length of hose, I don't know what it is, six, eight feet or something. So we can see what happens when we're going directly or via hose. 
So in RNC tools, I'll start a trend of this system and we will send an open loop signal to the system and see what happens. I actually have some shortcut commands set up here. Um, open loop signals, 30% one direction, minus 30% in the other direction. And if I hold the keyboard and press control on the keyboard and press 8, 9, or 0, I will move it. So let's try that here. Right now, the system is connected via the hard pipe. So we'll see how it responds there. So I'll send a voltage and stop it. Send another direction and stop it. And notice that this system, when we get going, it does overshoot on the voltage, but it doesn't really oscillate around much. But when I stop, it oscillates a whole bunch in both directions. So we have that oscillation going on. <clears throat> now, if I zoom on here and show the second cursor, we can look at the time difference. That time difference is displayed here in the detail window. It's about 56 milliseconds. So we see that that frequency is a little bit less than 20 hertz that it's oscillating at. Now, if we switch the system to connect via the hose, and our trusty organizer, AJ, here will switch the manual valves to connect it via the hose, now we'll see the system responds quite differently. We'll start a trend, move the system one direction, move it the other direction, and examine that. We see it shakes in either direction. If we zoom in, look at the time difference, we see that it's a well, let's get that there. It's about uh, 0.154. So that's a whole lot longer time than what we had. And so this 0.154 seconds, what's that? That's roughly six, six and a half hertz. So we went from a system that had a natural frequency of 20 hertz to a system that had a natural frequency of six and a half hertz. So adding hose to a system can significantly change that system. So let's look a little bit more at the details of the natural frequency of a hydraulic cylinder. There's an equation for it. It's uh, the square root of four times beta. Beta is the bulk modulus, which has to do with the compressibility of oil, times the piston area squared divided by the mass times the oil volume. Now you'll notice that we have two different areas on the piston. So this area here is just the average. So this is approximate. We could get a more fancy equation to calculate it, but this will do for now. Not very complicated actually to figure that this out if we have the right numbers and right units. I wanna point out something here. We see that we have A squared and then we have volume. And notice that the volume is proportional to the length of the cylinder times the area. Now this is approximate because we also have some dead volume between the cylinder and the valve, and hopefully that's fairly small. But what this means is that if the volume is proportional to area, then this whole equation, natural frequency, is actually proportional to the area squared over area, which is proportional to the square root of the area. And since the diameter squared is area, that means the natural frequency is approximately proportional to the diameter of the cylinder. So higher natural frequency means a stiffer system, so a larger diameter means a stiffer system and better control. Now this cylinder has a fairly small diameter, so we can actually see these second order effects quite easily as we're running it. Now I wanna talk about another frequency as well. This is the frequency of acceleration. So if we have a position profile in time, we see that the velocity looks like this. It ramps up to constant velocity, stays there, and then ramps down. Then we have the acceleration. The acceleration is at the beginning and at the end. And notice here that we have a certain time that it accelerates. And we can look at that time. 
So maybe it's 0.2 seconds here. This acceleration, we can talk about the frequency of acceleration. So this is half a cycle, so full frequency would be twice this, 0 0.2 seconds. And so if we want to calculate out to frequency, we do one divided by 0.2, which of course that would be five, but we're actually doing frequency half that. So we divide by two. So this frequency of acceleration is 2.5 Hertz. If we look at a different motion profile where we accelerate faster here, if that time is 0.1 seconds, then according to that formula, frequency of acceleration would be five Hertz. So it's faster. Now, in this example, the acceleration here was lower and this acceleration was higher, but the frequency of acceleration does not necessarily have anything to do with the amplitude of acceleration. If we were going to a very small velocity, we would need a lot less acceleration, but we could still do it very quickly. And even though we have a low acceleration, the frequency of acceleration could be very high. So this frequency of acceleration is fairly important when we talk about control. And it is important to understand that we're talking about the frequency of it, not the magnitude of it. So if you do a short little move and you do high frequency, you can still cause yourself a lot of problems. So we have natural frequency and frequency of acceleration that we've talked about. So what in the world is the significance of these two? Well, from research and practical experience and a lot of simulation, we have found that for good control with a PID algorithm, the natural frequency of a cylinder should be three to four times the frequency of acceleration. Now, if we use a more advanced algorithm, the PID2, where we have this double differential and jerk feed forward that we'll be covering today, then the natural frequency only needs to be two to two and a half times the frequency of acceleration. And of course, this is approximate. There's gonna be things that affect it, but if we're talking about a well-designed system, these are values that we normally look at. So what this means is that the required cylinder diameter in your application is determined by your desired frequency of acceleration. So when you design a system, you need to know how fast does this thing have to accelerate and that will help determine your cylinder diameter. Of course, there's other things that affect cylinder diameter that may override this, but there's some systems where you have to make sure your, your cylinder is wide enough to be stiff enough to get the kind of control you want. Now, conversely, for any given cylinder, and of course the mass attached to it, there's a limit to how quickly it can accelerate. So natural frequency and frequency of acceleration are very important. We saw the natural frequency when we did um, some motion on the system here. And when we do uh, closed loop control with a profile, we need to pay attention to our acceleration in order to figure out or in order to help control it well. So now we will switch and talk about these higher order gains and feed forwards, a double differential gain and jerk feed forward that help us control under damped systems. So we're gonna go through and talk about the PID and then how these add to the PID. And I also wanna point out that we're talking here about precisely following a motion profile. We're not talking about a step jump like I showed you, but a motion profile where our position accelerates, goes to constant velocity, and then decelerates and gets to a position. And we have the target, the blue line, and the actual is a red line, and the point is get it to follow as closely as we can. So the PID algorithm. We have the proportional gain, integral gain, derivative gain, which in Delta software we call it the differential gain, same term, and then velocity feed forward, acceleration feed forward. All of these contribute to the control signal to the valve. But we're going to add to them the second derivative gain, which we call double differential in the RMC tool software, and the jerk feed forward. All of these are calculated continuously. For example, every millisecond, whatever we happen to have the loop time set to on our controller. So we'll run through the PID first. The proportional gain is proportional to the position error. 
The position error is the target position minus the actual position, so fairly simple. And if we look at kind of an intuitive understanding of this, if we have the target position out here and the actual position back here, let's say we're moving a block, then the proportional gain looks at that error and gives us an amount of control output relative to that distance. So if we're far away, we push hard, and as we get closer, we push less hard. And as we get closer yet, we push even less. This is exactly how you and I would control a system. If it's far away, we push hard. And the closer we get, the less we push to try to get fine control there. So the proportional gain does exactly that. So if we look at a plot of the proportional gain, here's our target position where we want to be. And let's say this is the actual position. The proportional gain looks at the difference between the target and the actual and gives us an amount of control output at that instant that's proportional to that difference. So we see here at the beginning, we have very little. And as the plot goes on, we have bigger and bigger error. So the control output will become bigger and bigger and bigger. Then over here, as the error becomes smaller and smaller, our control output will be smaller and smaller. And that's exactly what the control output here looks like. It's small to begin with, gets bigger and bigger as the error is bigger, and then it gets smaller as the error reduces. The proportional gain has one significant problem. If the actual position is close to the target position, it might be very, very close, and the proportional gain only gives a little bit of control output and doesn't quite get us there maybe if there's a little extra friction. So to help with this, we can actually use the integral gain. The integral gain is similar to the proportional gain in that it looks at the target and actual position, but it also works with the element of time. So let's say there's a difference here. And so we start pushing this block to get to the target position. And as time passes, if it still doesn't get there, well, we push harder. And as more time passes, we push harder yet. That's how the integral gain works. And that's exactly how you and I would control a system as well. We start pushing on it, and if it doesn't get there, we push harder and harder until it finally moves and gets to the target position. The integral gain has one problem, that if we push harder and harder and harder, and it doesn't go, and then it finally lets go, well, it will move, and then we might overshoot the position. This is exactly what would happen to you and me if we did this. I'm sure many of you have had this happen. And the integral gain has that same issue that we have to mind. So the integral gain, we say that it sums the position error over time and gives us a control output proportional to that. Looking at a plot, let's say we look at that same plot with the same kind of error. The integral gain looks at the error, but it sums it up over time. So we see here at the beginning, it's only a little bit and it gets more and more and more. So it's going to summing up faster and faster and faster as the error increases. And then as error decreases, it'll still keep summing it, but not at the same rate. And over here, the error goes negative. So then the control output from the integral gain will start decreasing. So that looks like this. It starts increasing. And as the error gets bigger, notice the rate of increase of the control output gets bigger. And then as the error gets smaller, the rate decreases. And as the error switches, now the control output from the integral gain decreases all the, uh, in the other direction. Now with the integral gain, if we have the same issue where we just about are at position and the proportional might not get us there, the integral gain is very good at getting us into the final position because it sums this error over time it will finally give enough force to actually get to the requested position. Next is the differential gain. The differential gain is often more difficult to understand. But remember the proportional gain was proportional to the position error. The differential gain is proportional to the velocity error. The velocity error is just the target velocity minus the actual velocity. Let's look at what that looks like on a plot. So we have a motion and the system is kind of oscillating a little bit. If we look at this point right here, we know from the proportional gain that the target minus the actual here is zero. So the proportional gain should give us zero. 
But you and I can both tell that we want the system to go at our target velocity, but it's currently going at an actual velocity that isn't higher than that. So it's not enough for us to give zero voltage here. We want to kind of get this thing to, to slow down a little bit. We have to give some negative voltage. And that's exactly what the derivative gain does. It looks at the target velocity, subtracts the actual velocity, and gives us some control output proportional to that. So the target velocity is small and the actual is bigger. So small minus bigger is going to be negative. So the differential gain will give us a negative control output to try to keep the position on track with the target profile. The derivative gain kind of helps provide some damping in that way. So now we're going to talk about the double derivative gain. So if we look at that same plot, we see here the proportional gave us zero, the differential gave us negative, and now we look at the double derivative which works on acceleration. So this is our target acceleration here. We accelerate up during the motion and then in the middle where we have constant velocity, we're just zero acceleration. And then at the end, we decelerate to bring the position to a stop. So right in the middle here, we want to have zero acceleration. And if you remember from algebra class, a position curve that's curving up means you have positive acceleration. And a position curve that's curving the other direction is a negative acceleration. So right at this point, we see that we have a positive acceleration. We're in a curve upward. And the double derivative gain, it looks at the target acceleration minus the actual acceleration. So the target here is zero, and the actual acceleration is positive. So zero minus a positive gives us a negative. So the double differential gain will give us a negative value right here to try to keep this acceleration from happening too much so we can try to follow our target better. So to review these gains, the PD and D2 gains, the proportional gain tells us about or gives us control output relative to where we are. The derivative gives us control output relative to where we are going. And the double derivative gives us output relative to where we are going to be going, basically acceleration. So each one of these gives a little bit farther look ahead. The D helps provide damping and the D2 helps provide even more because it looks even farther ahead than what the D gain does. The double derivative helps us compensate for energy that is stored in the oil that is acting like a spring. And we'll see that a little bit later as we talk about the jerk feed forward. There's one major problem with the double derivative gain, and that is that it works on the actual acceleration, which is really noisy. This is what it looks like. It's hard to make heads or tails of that. And if we subtract a nice target and this noisy acceleration, we get a really noisy signal that comes out of the control output and causes all kinds of problems on our system. Now, if we have low resolution, then we have even more quantization error because we're calculating the velocity from the position and the acceleration from the velocity in a digital world to cause a problem. So we really need high resolution on our position sensor for this type of algorithm to work. But to deal with this, we have a couple different ways. Um, we can generate a mathematical system model, and then we can have an observer that looks at what we're sending the control out put to the system and what the position does. And from that, it can actually calculate out a clean acceleration and it's starting to look like that noisy signal we saw. It can look literally this clean, like here. It doesn't work that well in all systems, but a lot of times it does. Or instead of doing that, or in combination of doing that, we can use an output filter. So all that noise from the noise acceleration, it can go to the control output, but then we can filter it out. And that also can work. Although we generally find the best success is using the system model to calculate clean acceleration. Now we'll talk a bit about feed forwards. 
on a hydraulic cylinder, if we give a control signal to the four-way proportional valve, it will give us a velocity output, basically. You know, once things settle out and it becomes to a constant velocity. So the control signal is generally proportional to the velocity. That means that if we give the cylinder a 10% signal and say it goes at 30 millimeters per second, if we do double that, it will go twice the speed and three times that, it will go three times the speed. That means that if we're going to command it at a certain speed, like 100 millimeters per second, we know ahead of time what the control signal is going to be. And in this case, it would be 33.3%. So this velocity feed forward is proportional to the target velocity. And the important thing is that we know the target velocity ahead of time because we're commanding the position profile. So if we look at a plot, this is the position that goes up and then we add the velocity to it. The velocity feed forward will give us a amount of control output proportional to this velocity. So say it looks like this, the green one, and that gives us most of the control output we need for the system. And the P, I, and D don't have to work as hard at all. Then we have the acceleration feed forward, which is very similar but it works on the acceleration, the target acceleration. And again, we know what the target acceleration is ahead of time. So if we look at a plot, here's our position and our velocity, the acceleration is at the beginning and at the end. So if we give some control out pro proportional to this, that means we'll get a boost at the beginning to get going and a break at the end to help us slow down. Looks like that. With these feed forwards, the system is able to track the target profile just about exactly. If we had a PID, we would not be able to because the PI and D gains, they all work on an error on the system. So we're not going to be moving unless we have an error. Well, the feed forwards help get rid of that error and now we can follow profile exactly and have really great control. So the feed forwards are very, very important for that. In addition to the velocity and acceleration feed forward, when we talk about a second order system, the jerk feed forward is very important. So we're gonna look here at the position and we're just gonna look at the position where it starts from zero and accelerates and then goes to constant velocity. So we're not ending it here. We're just looking at where it goes from zero to constant velocity and the velocity, it goes from zero and goes up to a constant velocity and stays at that velocity. So we're looking specifically at the acceleration phase here. And this is basically applying a force to a spring that moves a mass. Now, we'll get rid of the position just to make this a little bit simpler. We'll look at the target acceleration when we want this force to accelerate the mass. This is how we want to move the system. And remember, we had the acceleration feed forward that will give some proportional control output here to help us get going. Well, when we start accelerating the spring, the spring will compress and the mass will move a little bit. The spring, of course, is taking up some of the energy that we're applying, so we're not getting the mass moving as far as we wanted to. So we maybe gave this much effort and the mass only moved this far because some of the energy is in the spring. So what happens then is that our acceleration over here, the actual acceleration doesn't quite follow the target like we wanted, it's lagging behind. And that means the velocity here is also gonna be lagging behind because some of that energy is taken up in the spring. Now, as the target acceleration goes down and our target or our control output starts going down as well, that energy will start coming out of the spring. So as we continue moving the system, notice the spring expands a little bit. So when we give the same effort as we did before here, now all of a sudden that mass moves a lot farther because it's moving from this force plus the energy coming out of the spring. And we see this actual acceleration now starts overshooting. And of course that continues with the energy coming in and out of the spring. And so we get some oscillation here. 
and the actual velocity as well will overshoot and it will continue oscillating. Now, to counteract that, we have the jerk feed forward. So in the acceleration, we know we're gonna be falling behind at the beginning. So we wanna give some extra oomph to the system right there. So we do the jerk, which is proportional to the acceleration rate. Notice the rate of acceleration is here is high, so it's high. The acceleration is flat, so that means the rate is zero. So we have zero here in the jerk. And the acceleration rate is negative here, so the jerk is negative. So we're gonna use this jerk V forward and give a control output that's proportional to that. So we give extra control output in the beginning of acceleration because we know the spring is gonna take up that energy and we need to put that in there. And then at the end of acceleration, where we know the energy is gonna be coming out of the spring, we put negative control output there to make up for that extra energy. So now when we move the system, the acceleration should follow quite well, and then the velocity should follow quite well, and we won't oscillate. Now, if we look at the spring, how that works, the force is applied to spring or to the mass. And now, instead of giving just a little bit of effort, we give a whole lot of effort because we add that jerk feed forward to it, and then the mass moves as we desire it. And then towards the end of acceleration, now we give just a little bit, because remember the jerk, it pulls out some of the effort from the force because we know we have extra energy in the spring that's coming out. And then this less effort plus the energy in the spring ends up in a decent movement of the mass. And we get much better control here. So that's how the jerk feed forward works. So now we've talked about PID and double D and we've talked about velocity and acceleration and jerk feed forward, how those work on an underdamp system. So now the question is tuning with a double differential and jerk feed forward. Delta's recommendation is that you use the tuning wizard in RMC tools because manual tuning is difficult. It's possible to manually tune it, but when we get into control theory and look at pole placement and optimal tuning, it's very difficult to uh, get something that manually would actually be reasonable from control theory perspective. Now with the tuning wizard, we of course have the auto tuning, but you can also use the existing plot method where you get your own plot or after you've tuned it a bit, you can actually rerun it and refine the tuning after you auto tune it. So we're going to try to tune this system and see how it works. Right now, I actually have it tuned from before. Uh, we will set these gains to their default. Let's see, uh, we'll leave the output bias there so the system stays still when we give zero voltage. Download that. And now we'll start the tuning wizard. We'll choose the auto tuning wizard accept the agreement there that everything is the user's fault. And here we select a number of moves. We always wanna have two moves, one in each direction because a hydraulic cylinder behaves differently in each direction of motion. This defines the beginning and end points of our move, the open loop move that's going to be doing. Click next, and now we move the system to start, and we'll see down here the system will move towards an approximate starting location. We'll click move positive, and it'll do a jerky move. Gives me an error here, it says there's un insufficient travel range available to generate enough plot data. You can continue with this plot, but results may not be accurate. I'll continue with that plot. That maybe gave us enough. We'll see. We'll click next, and now we do the other direction. We move to start. Now we click to move negative, and we get that same error. So let's see. Well, it gave us some kind of plot. We'll see if it can figure it out from that. Click next. And here it gives me a first order model, but if I want to do tuning with a double differential, I need to change it to a second order model. So we click the advanced button here and uncheck this box that limits us to a first order model. 
And now we see that it selected a second order model for both of them. I've noticed that if we uncheck this box, it's not necessarily going to select a second order model. It's going to select the best model it can, which is zero order, first order, or second order. But unchecking this lets it also look at second order. And we see here the uh, natural frequency is 18.8 hertz, and here it's 18.7 hertz. Remember, we saw from the uh, first motion on there that frequency was slightly under 20. So this looks fairly accurate. Every once in a while, these numbers can have problems and give us something totally wrong. So we kind of always want to double check it. So this, this looks all right. So click OK and finish. And now we get a slider bar here where we can move it up and down. And remember, you always want to move it down towards the bottom to be kind of conservative to begin with so don't slam the system around. Now we set up these moves here to move. And I'm moving to a position of one. We'll do a speed of 20 and we'll try acceleration and deceleration of 100. And we'll do the same speed, excel and decel to a position of 13. See what happens. So I'll click move to one. And our actual position is falling way behind so I can increase this quite a bit. Uh, let me just double check here, make sure I don't have the uh, feedback filter set. I actually do have that set. I do not want to have that set right now. Um, so we can demonstrate this a little bit better how it works. Okay, so let's move that again. I'll apply those gains. Do a little less. I'm hearing a little noise in the system. It sounds a little scary. Okay, so we moved it, and notice that we have all this noise in the control output. If we go look at, I think I have another plot here set up with the acceleration, and that should have captured as well with that move. Um, yes, so here we have that plot. The actual acceleration is yellow. Notice that it looks really, really, really noisy. And of course, it comes out in control output, and that's causing us all kinds of grief and aggravation here. So I can filter the control output, or I can fix the, the acceleration with the feedback. We'll try filtering the control output first. So I'll set that filter to, uh, I'll see if 100 is enough. Begin with, move to one. Oh, look at that. That improved it quite a bit, but I still have problems here, so I could, do a little bit more filtering, uh, but we'll look a little bit on the acceleration then try that model-based filtering. So if I look at the plot with the acceleration, um, no, that was the wrong one, this one here, we see that we still have a lot of noise in acceleration. So we'll go to Axis Tools in the Axis Parameters on the All tab, in the Feedback section, I go to the Input Filter, and notice this is the RMC 200, the 75-150, the filtering is slightly different here, but they also have the model-based filter. So we choose model, and what it does, it looks at this model that it just obtained when I did the auto-tuning, and th those parameters from that model are here. So I'll click download, and now it's calculating out accelerations based on this model and the mathematical observer we have there. So if we go to the plot manager and try to do move again, now we see my control output is very, very clean. And let's see, that's with the output filter still on there. I suppose I can leave the filter there, it shouldn't hurt anything. If it's that high, it's 100. If we look at a plot of that acceleration again, notice that this acceleration all of a sudden is way cleaner. So now the double differential gain can actually work on it without causing us a lot of problems. So we should be able to increase this gain, move back and forth. We're not falling real great there, so we should be able to increase the gain quite a bit. Move to 13, we're falling a little bit better, but I can still increase it, apply those gains. Move to one and better yet, but it looks like we can still increase it. One thing that I'm watching here is the control output. If it starts oscillating a lot, that means we're getting a little bit too high on the gain, but the control output is very smooth here, so I should be able to continue to increase this. 
and is controlling better and better. And looks like it's getting pretty good there. Let's see, I don't know how high I dare go here. I suppose we'll find out if we go too high. And I've been able to increase the gains quite a bit and we're just following better and better. So now P gain is up to 800, that's quite a lot. Okay, notice the control output is starting to have a little bit of noise on it. So if I keep increasing much more, I'm a little bit concerned of giving problems, but I'm actually controlling quite well here on this second order system. And we're getting to position real quick. It's 0.997 shortly after the move where we're told to go to one, so only three thousandths off. And then over here, it's dead nuts on on the end. Now, let's see if I can do the same control without the double differential gain. If we, uh, let's see, if we move those gains, that won't necessarily be a fair comparison. Um, but we can probably do the tuning wizard with those previous plots we got and just choose the, uh, the first order. So we'll put an open loop here so we're not controlling In the access tools. I'll turn off the model based filter. Well, actually, I can leave it on. It won't, won't matter if we're using just PID because it doesn't look at it at all. So if we go to the tuning wizard and use existing plot, I can go look for those plots that we had of auto tuning. Let's see if I go back here far enough, we should have, um, let's see, I had one there. And then we'll do the other direction right there. And we'll leave it at first order, finish. And then we'll see if we can apply some gains and let's see if we control. Um, so on the first order, we are actually controlling reasonably well with this, but let's, let's try this. Let's crank up the gains here and see if this system can control with the higher acceleration. So we're increasing the frequency of acceleration. Now, actually, let me make sure here that we're applying that correctly. Uh, if we go here to the all, the control, the jerk feed forward zero, double different zero. Yes, we're applying that correctly. And let's see, did I change that? We'll actually try 300. We'll kind of exercise the system a bit heavily. And we'll move to one. And notice that we're oscillating here now. And this is in first order control. Maybe you can hear through my mic that it's kind of making noise and it took a long time to get there. Um, I'm not quite sure. I suppose I can increase the tuning maybe a little bit, see if it'll try to reduce oscillation. Um, that didn't work. It's just oscillating away. You can see in the uh, video a little bit, the whole thing's shaking. Um, so maybe I can decrease the gains a little bit. Let's see if that works. Um, well, it's oscillating less, but we're kind of having problems here at the beginning and the end. Um, decrease the gains more. And okay, so it's oscillating less, but now we're not tracking so well at the beginning and the end here as we were. Um, but if we now go back and do the tuning wizard again with the second order system, I suppose I should have saved those gains out would be easier, but we can do the tuning wizard with the existing uh, plots that we had for the auto tuning. So we'll use that one. And then for the second one, we will use, uh, where was it? I think I passed it there, uh, auto tuning that one. And we'll go to advance, uncheck that, second order. We have those same values, looks like. Uh, finish. And let's see, we can probably crank those gains up quite a bit, but let's see, let's make sure we still have the model order 
or the model-based feedback going, yes, I do have that. And then we can crank up the gains. We know that quite a bit. Apply the gains. And now we'll make a move. Um, we're oscillating a little bit there. We'll apply some more gains here. Apply the gains. And notice that with the second order, we're actually tuning, controlling better with less oscillation. I'm um, getting some oscillation here on this move. Not quite sure if I should increase the gains, if that will help or hurt, but we'll try it. We're up at 1,477. Um, and on that move, the retract, it worked. On the extend, we had a problem here. So it looks like I cranked the gains up too much. So we will reduce those. And it looks like I'm probably hitting the limit here on how much I can decelerate. See, I'm getting a little bit of shaking, but we did see that it tuned up better on the second order than it did on the first order for this system where we have the small, narrow cylinder and heavy load. So now I'm going to try and see what happens when we do this with the hose in the system. Remember, that will change the frequency to six hertz. So uh, our trusty organizer, AJ, will change the hose, change those valves. So now we're going through the hose. Let's go try to tune that up. We'll set the gains back to their default values. And we'll do the auto tuning. Move to the starting position. Now we'll do a positive move and gives a complaint, but hope to get enough info. Click next, move to start. Now we do a negative move. So it moves. We saw it move in the video and we see a plot here. Click next. And uh, just for grins, we'll try the first order first and see how that works. We'll do finish. And let's see, we probably have to reduce our acceleration quite a bit, I'm guessing. We'll try 100 and see what happens. Uh, let's see, apply those gains. I see Perry Yoder pointed out to me previously that I need to apply gains. So even at Delta, we forget things sometimes. Okay, so here we're having a little bit of control issues. Uh, okay, so this thing started oscillating and oscillated more and more and more and more and more. Um, so I don't think I can increase the gains at all. Maybe decrease them a bit, but now we won't be controlling very well at all. So let's say I was stuck with the system. I, I needed to make a control. What is the absolutely best way, easiest way to make a control well? Uh, if anybody has an idea, you can put your answer in the chat window. No answers yet. It's one of the most common techniques that we use out in the field to help uh, with systems. Let's see, we got some answers here, more PD and output filter. Um, yes, there's a possibility of that sometimes. Second order, uh, yes, exactly. Second order, we'll go to that and we'll do it. Ooh, Perry Yoder, you get a good answer there. Reduce the acceleration. That's the simplest, easiest way to improve control in most situations. Right now we're oscillating and so, I have an acceleration of 100. The simplest way is just simply reduce that. So I'll go down to 30, and that in itself may fix it without having to worry about any other control issues. Okay, so it improved it, but this system is so shaky with this long length of hose that even that isn't really doing much. Um, let's see if we can decrease to 10, but now 10 is, too slow to get up to speed. So if I really need the same speed, then, okay, so this system, I'll try decreasing the gains here, see if that helps it. So this system was not helped significantly by decreasing the Excel and D cell 
unless we decrease it so much that we're basically not doing a significant motion. So the answers you guys uh, gave as well are things that we'll have to explore to actually get this to control. So I'll put this back to 100 and 100, and we will rerun the tuning wizard and do the second order. So I use existing plots because we already did the auto tuning and those are up there. I'll use that first one and then I'll use that second one and we'll go to advanced, allow second order. And we see that it choose six and a half Hertz, 6.35 Hertz. This is pretty much what we saw. So we know we can trust those numbers. Click finish. And now we get the gain calculator and let me just double check, make sure we're on that model based feedback filter. We are, so we have good clean accelerations. So we should have hopefully some success. We'll see if we can actually meet that 100 acceleration. So I'll crank this gain up a little bit and we move. Oh, look at that. We're actually getting something decent here. We'll crank this up a little bit more, apply the gains and some more, move it back and forth, uh, we'll crank it up quite a bit here, see if we can actually do that. Okay, so I'm starting to get a little bit of noise here, so I can actually put some output filter on there. So we'll throw in 100, that's a generally good starting value, so we're not doing too much filtering. And as we move it, okay, cleaned up the control output a little bit. So let's increase this gain, apply the gains, move it back and forth, and we're getting better and better. Okay, so now I have a problem. It continually did some very, very small oscillations here. Um, I'm not quite sure why it's such high frequency oscillations. There's maybe some slightly loose connection. There's a misalignment coupling between the cylinder and the load. I don't know if maybe there's something with the uh, sensor mount, but it's pretty solid. But we are seeing some high frequency that's not related to the low frequency of the hose. Um, but let's see if I can throw more filtering in there. If I go down to 40, let's see if that helps prevent that. Okay, so we did a move there with no problems. Move here. Okay, we're getting that oscillation and I can hear it in the system and I kind of just barely see it. And that could uh, damage the system after a long time. So I think I might be at my limit here. Might have to decrease the gains a little bit. And let's see if we move it. Okay, got that, move it up. Got that, okay, we're not getting that oscillation anymore. Um, but as I continue tuning and playing with it, I'm going to have to keep that in mind that I really don't want that high frequency oscillation. So this is about as good as I have it now. Uh, if I put the cursor in the middle, we're actually following very, very closely. Here it's within a thousandth. Over there it's within five thousandths. Here it's within, oh, it's right on. And here at the end, I'm undershooting by 40 thousandths, but pretty quickly looks like it gets to within like three thousandths here. And as I move on, it's within, well, it kind of goes around a little bit, plus or minus five, six thousandths. Um, but that's uh, what happens when you have hose between the valve and the cylinder. It really makes for a cruddy system and difficult to control. You saw immediately when you switched to the hose, all of a sudden things were much more difficult to control. Um, but you can also see that with a double differential gain, we actually have a lot of tools to control either an undersized cylinder or a system with a lot of hose between the valve and the cylinder. Now I'll try a little bit more here um, on this system. I think if we just decrease acceleration a bit, we should be able to get better control. Let's see if I change to 60 and we'll change it to 60 there. So we'll move to one and it's undershooting a little bit there and a little bit there. Um, so we're getting, I suppose roughly, if I look at these numbers here, the target actual position as I move the cursor, uh, about similar control. So notice that it, 
it was right on. And then here towards the end, I don't know how well it comes through the webinar, but the target and actual position separate just a little bit. And so it's just not holding position as well as it did when we were using the hard pipe from the valve to the cylinder. So that's about it for uh, tuning a system that's under damped and controlling. There are some important concepts we learned here. Um, we have the PID2 and jerk feed forward that we can use for under damped systems. And this allows for smaller diameter cylinders. I actually did a rough calculation here some time ago on this system. And if I want to get decent control with this cylinder in the PID, I have to increase that diameter to about 1.4 inches. And of course I would choose the next size up, which is 1.5 inches. And now I have a cylinder that the area is more than twice of what I had if it was a one inch cylinder. And energy is what, pressure times flow. And so if I more than double the flow, now my energy is increasing by two. So I'm actually using more energy on that bigger cylinder. So the PID2 can allow for smaller diameter cylinders, which allows for less energy. Um, it is a little bit tricky to apply this. As you saw, we got that high frequency oscillation. And uh, if there's any slop in the system or low resolution feedback, it does have problems, so you have to be selective on the system that you apply it to, but it can still, in certain situations, help save energy with small diameter cylinder. Acceleration and deceleration is important. We noticed that as we commanded a higher and lower accelerations, um, it really changed the control. And finally, hose is bad. If you want to cause yourself problems, put your valve far away from this cylinder with a lot of hose and you'll have no end of fun figuring out your problems. Now there are some systems where there is no other option and you have to put the valve remotely. That we understand. The real great thing is we do have algorithms to actually deal with that. Now there's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, let's see, fine tuning, double differential jerk feed forward whether that would help my control um, as I was running its limitations. Um, that's iffy. If, if you have a real good sense of it, you can maybe try to manually adjust those values, jerk feet forward, double differential gain, tweak them a little bit. Um, but like I said, it's very difficult, so it's nicer to just use the uh, wizard. But that said, there's usually always some improvement that can be had. Another question, is there an output filter rate rule of thumb compared to system frequency. So like 6.5 Hertz with hose. Um, for the output filter, the value you want to choose, yes, you want it to have, want it to be quite a few times larger than the natural frequency of the system. So a lot of systems, you know, they might run, you know, we saw this one was 20 Hertz. Um, that's a very common value of the system. And so you want to be several times higher than that, usually at least for a starting value. Um, say 100, but we generally want to be larger than the frequency of motion. And remember the natural frequency needs to be higher than the frequency of motion. So the frequency of motion is typically maybe two, three, four, five Hertz, if that. And so the output filter, we can often bring it down to like 20 or even 10 or five sometimes on systems where we're doing, doing really low motion. The nice thing is hydraulic cylinders, you know, they're a physical thing that exists. We're not and, and they're you know generally good size. So we're not looking at output filter values that can range from 0.1 to 1,000. We're generally looking at values from 100, anywhere down to 10 or five. Another question, can you do a webinar for pneumatic system tuning? Uh, yes, we can. Actually, we have a pneumatic system here and uh, we'll put that on the schedule sometime to do pneumatic systems. Pneumatic systems are quite a bit harder than hydraulic systems, even though a lot of the concepts are the same. Any other questions before we close? Oh, I see one other question asked. Can you have a different gain for forward and back direction? And yes, the gains we actually have, they are all ratioed off the feed forwards. So they are automatically different for forward and backward direction. 
And remember, Delta Tech support is always just an email or a phone call away. I also want to encourage you to sign up for getting a free hydraulic design guide if you have not already done so. Go to our web page at deltamotion.com. It's on the home page. You can click the link, enter your contact info, and we will mail you a paper copy. And that will help you design systems so that you don't have to deal with the problems that we're dealing with today, like with hose. And so with that, thank you. Thank you, Jacob, and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. You will automatically receive a survey asking for feedback. It's just a short four question survey. We would really appreciate it if you give us feedback on these webinars. And it also has an area there where you can suggest future topics that you'd be interested in hearing about. I mentioned that this webinar was being recorded and those recordings will be available at deltamotion.com, our website. If you go to the education uh, area, you'll see a page, a link there for webinars, and you'll see a schedule for our upcoming webinars, and you'll also see links for recordings of these webinars. Also, we are posting these on our discussion forum. That's located at forum.deltamotion.com, and look for the topic that says Delta Webinar Series. It's right there. And then finally, Delta also has a YouTube channel. It's Delta Motion Control, all one word, and we are posting the recordings on that YouTube channel as well. Thank you for joining us.